Hello. Uh, this presentation is intended as a continuation of the one I prepared for last year's ASC conference. Last year I focused on purposiveness or goal-directed behavior and on understanding what counts as a goal-oriented system and how one can draw a distinction around such systems. The problem that I would like to address here came up while I was researching goal-orientedness and it involves another fundamental concept namely the concept of feedback. As someone who has designed and built simple feedback systems, I didn't find the concept problematic at all. I thought I understood it well. However, I couldn't but notice that there is quite a bit of foundational instability surrounding the concept of feedback in the literature. The first thing that got my attention was a 1975 paper by William Wimsatt, titled Some Problems with the Concept of Feedback, and in it Wimsatt makes some strong claims. Among other things, he argues that purely on the basis of observable behavior, it may be impossible to distinguish between systems that contain feedback loops and open loop systems tending towards steady state equilibrium. Also, he argues that feedback can be largely considered as an artifact of our mode of representation of systems. Now, his criticism is not totally convincing. In particular, the example he provides of a non-feedback system is quite certainly a trivial feedback system, but also not entirely unconvincing. And then I found an entry in a uh, in Ross Ashby's journal. In fact, a number of related entries from 1949 where Ashby made the shocking assertion that goal-seeking behavior does not necessarily imply feedback, something that appeared to contradict the basic tenets of the field. This led me to suspect that there may be, after all, a subtle problem with the definitions of feedback and goal-seeking that interferes with our attempts to draw distinctions based on these concepts. In order to find clarity on feedback, I decided to consider the issue from a pure system theoretic angle. The problem with taking the general systems approach is that the entire mathematical apparatus of calculus and real and complex analysis goes completely out the window and one is forced to operate in an unfamiliar, barren and strange terrain with very few tools available. However, there is a definite advantage to it and namely, without assumptions of structure, it is possible to design a more general and more widely applicable theory and obtain a more complete view of the concepts being investigated. Another reason why I believe it's useful to take this perspective is the fundamental compatibility between general systems and second-order cybernetics. In cybernetics, as well as in systems theory, the basic unit of analysis is essentially an information processing unit, usually represented as a functional block, which is able to transform inputs into outputs. The most general specification of a system, as given in Mesarovich and Takahara, involves an input space and an output space which may or may not have further internal structure in the relation from input to output. The input space and the output space are assumed to represent the full variety of mutually exclusive input and output conditions and the behavior of the system can be probabilistic or deterministic, in which case the relation becomes a function. From a second-order cybernetic perspective, the same construct can be interpreted as a process of observation and interaction between an observer and the system, with the input space representing the circumstances and methods of observation and interaction, and the output space representing the results of observation and interaction as defined and registered by an observer. A feedback system, according to Mesarovich and Takahara, presupposes an input space defined as the product of the feedback and other inputs. SF is the feedback processor and it just takes the system's outputs and transforms them into input macro states. 
This is equivalent to a finite state automaton with internal states, where the response to any given input depends on input and internal state, and the internal state depends on the current output. Equivalently, it can be represented as a collection of simpler machines with inputs X and outputs Y, where the current feedback value decides which one of these machines is going to respond to the current input. So the current output modulates the response to the next input. It is interesting to note that the general system with feedback as constructed by Meserovich and Takahara is equivalent to a non-trivial machine as defined by Heinz von Forster, which is another interesting point of convergence between systems and second-order cybernetics. The important question to be asked about it is, is this the simplest and most general model of a feedback process, and can it account for the instability and confusion surrounding the concept of feedback? Looking at this construct in the context of the thought experiment documented by Ashby in 1949, I found that the concept of feedback as defined in GST does not appear to be general enough although its scope is broad enough to cover the trivial feedback situation considered by Ashby, it relies on an assumption of structure in the input space of the model system. Ashby was looking at goal-orientedness and feedback in a very restricted setting, inherited from Newtonian physics, in which an idealized physical system is considered in isolation as a sort of world unto itself. In this particular setting, a single configuration space, typically a multidimensional field or manifold on which a vector field is defined, serves as both input and output space. The output state of such a system constitutes a full specification of its next input state. At each infinitesimal step in the evolution of this system, the output state becomes the new input state. Thus, closure, in the cybernetic sense, is provided by the identity function on the unique state space. Clearly, the situation considered by Ashby is far from what one would consider as the general case. In a general system as defined in GST, input and output are generally distinct spaces. The question then becomes, what is the simplest construction that provides closure when the input and output spaces are distinct? That can be defined without assuming any particular structure in the input and output spaces. Clearly, since we, we want this construction to deliver inputs to the system, its range should be the system's input space. This leaves the question, what should its domain be? If we make it a map from B into A, it would mean that the new input should be determined exclusively by the current output, which is far from being the general case, and in fact only makes sense for the type of systems considered by Ashby, where input and output coincide. Going back to the intuitive understanding of a general system, if we think of the new input as an outcome of the system's action at a certain point in time, then to the extent that we can predict this outcome at all, it will generally depend not just on the action, that is the output state, but also on the circumstances in which the action is taken, that is the input state. Thus, the simplest and most general construct that provides informational closure to a general system is a map with domain A times B and range A. What this map describes, in fact, is the larger environment in which the open loop system is embedded, in which it can only access through its input and output spaces. In other words, what this process represents is for all intents and purposes the world as experienced from the perspective of the system under consideration. In the following, I will refer to this construct as the complement of the system because in a certain sense it includes absolutely everything that may contribute to or influence what the next input state of our system will be, of course, as seen from the limited perspective of our system. 
Note that in order to be able to compose the system and complement transfer functions, it is necessary to first trivially factor the system function through the product of input and output spaces. Based on this construction, it is possible to have a general notion of feedback without introducing additional structure on the state spaces. This notion is sufficiently general to cover both the trivial situation described by Ashby and the model proposed by Mesarovich and Takahara. In situations where the input and output spaces can be analyzed further, e.g. as product spaces, it is possible to define specific feedback processes and channels as illustrated on this slide. Very importantly, we can consider these specific feedback channels as part of the complement that is external to the system, or we can draw the distinction between system and complement in such a way as to include some of the feedback processes as part of the system. The GST model of feedback, as given by Mesarovich and Takahara, would correspond with figure 4, but with the additional constraint that the feedback values in Z would be independent on A and would depend only on the output state in B. To conclude, my point was that in a system theoretic view, the most general formulation of feedback is a deterministic or probabilistic process with domain input times output and range input. This is the least specific and least constrained structure that can feed back information to a general system. More specific feedback structures can be defined only under the assumption that it is possible to further analyze the input and output spaces of the original system into subspaces. Finally, I would like to say that, in my experience, the complement is very useful as a systemic and cybernetic concept. Whenever a system is modeled or designed, whenever a set of inputs and outputs are defined, it is useful to try to understand how the environment or the world looks like from the perspective of that particular set of inputs and outputs or perception and action capabilities, and what internal and external feedback loops there may be. Thank you for your attention, and I welcome your questions and, of course, your feedback.